hello. I'm Carol Hilty, superintendent of the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind, CSDB. Welcome. I'm happy that you have decided to watch this program. I hope that you enjoy it. We welcome your feedback. Learning from Adult Role Models Who Are Blind or Low Vision, presented by Outreach Programs, the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind. The CSDB logo is displayed with the tagline, Learning, Thriving, Leading. A woman is standing indoors in front of a stone wall. Captions are below on screen. Title, Amy. Hi, my name is Amy Gunning. I am a teacher of the visually impaired, working in the elementary department in the, in the School for the Blind at the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind. I have a visual condition called cone rod dystrophy. And I like to tell people that cone rod dystrophy is like an algebra problem because it my vision depends so much on very many variables. Um, lighting, lighting conditions is like the number one variable that determines how much I can see, what I can see, how clearly I can see it. Um, whether I'm indoors or outdoors makes a big difference. How much glare there is makes a big difference on what I can and cannot see. Growing up with this, I loved school. I loved learning. I, I especially loved reading and I could read regular size print. I actually I still can read regular size print and I prefer print to, to this day. Um, in school though it was hard to read because of the overhead fluorescent lights. That's the worst lighting condition for me to be able to see things really well. So I, I learned to memorize a lot of information that teachers were saying, especially when they used blackboards and overheads. Overheads were like the hardest thing to see in the world with overhead fluorescent lighting in classrooms and then these bright overheads. But I, I really learned to memorize a lot what my teachers were saying and I probably did myself a little bit of a disservice because I could figure things out from what they were saying and I, I probably looked more like I could see more than I really actually could. Title, Assistive Devices. I do tend to use more magnifiers now either handheld magnifiers or what are called video magnifiers. They used to be called CCTVs, um, but those are very helpful. I really enjoy some of the newer ones that they've come out with, video magnifiers that are portable. They have cameras that can be pointed to information that is on a screen or a board or on walls around a room, and then they magnify it on a screen right in front of me and they're becoming more portable that, that are the size of laptops that you can carry around from place to place, rechargeable batteries, so you don't have to be dependent on plugging them in anywhere. And if that kind of technology had been available when I was in school, I would have loved that. That would have really made a big difference, I think, in school. Title, Parental Involvement. Probably one, one thing that made the biggest difference in my life was my parents because they never had a different expectation for me than my older sister just because I could not see as well as she did. I was expected to clean my room, expected to learn how to do laundry, sort laundry, 
anything she was expected to do, I was too. Do dishes, clean the house, learn as much as I could, expected to go to school and do well in school. That was huge, just to know that there was that belief in me that, you know, I didn't have to do things differently or less than my sister, just because I couldn't see as well as her. And that's what I would just love to tell every parent who has a child that has a visual impairment or actually probably any kind of impairment that just because something is impaired like you know just because my eyes don't work doesn't mean I can't do stuff and I as a teacher of students with visual impairments that is the one thing I I hope I mean I hope my students learn a lot of things but the very number one thing is to know that just because they have a visual impairment doesn't mean they can't do things either because that's hugely important and that that skill that kind of attitude has carried me through school early years growing up because kids you know kids made terrible fun of me said terrible things to me but having that family and friend foundation outside of school is what carried me through. Title, Career. A very good friend of mine encouraged me to see if I could qualify to go to vocational rehab, re vocational rehabilitation, to see if they could give me some career counseling guidance just because I was someone with a visual impairment. And I was able to do that. I qualified to receive some services. And the counselor I worked with was a person who was also visually impaired. And not only was she visually impaired, she had the exact same visual condition as I did. She was the first person I'd ever met who also had a visual impairment. And to meet someone with something as rare as what I had, was it was just very exciting. Well, she got me involved with working with the Head Start Preschool Program. And that was where I found education. Because growing up, a lot of people would say, do you want to be a teacher? Because I think you'd be good at it. And I never thought that I would be a very good teacher. But I, I found preschool, and I, I went to work for the Head Start program and really enjoyed working in the field of education. Well, besides helping me figure out what to do with my life, this counselor also introduced me to a ski program at the time was called Colorado Ski School for the Blind. And it was actually a program based out of Vail, but people met in Colorado Springs. And it was, it was an organization where people who are visually impaired and blind worked with sighted guides on the mountain to ski. Through the ski program where I learned to ski, I was also introduced to the sport of goalball, which is a sport that was developed specifically for athletes who are visually impaired and blind. And I started to play that. And one of my teammates was a dorm supervisor who worked at the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind. We played together, we played goalball together for many years. And to this day now, like I said at the very beginning, I am a teacher of the visually impaired, working in the elementary department at the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind. But even though I earned that master's degree, on top of that, I am engaged in ongoing learning and training opportunities to get to learn how to use latest technology, latest strategies that have come out to make the make education of students with visual impairments better for their the main part of my job as a teacher of the visually impaired is making making educational materials 
information and the environment accessible for my students so that they in turn have optimal learning opportunities. Another very important thing for people to know about anyone with a visual impairment is they might do it differently. It might take a longer time to learn something, but it's so possible for them to do it. And I just love being part of that encouragement to the students and their families. Title, Braille Competency. Another part of my education and training to be a teacher of the visually impaired is becoming Braille competent myself, knowing the Braille code, all the contractions that are involved with it, knowing the rules for their use and when you can't use them, and teaching that to the students. So even though I am still able to access print, I do know Braille so that I can teach it to my students and right now I can read it pretty well with my eyes, but I'm working to be able to read it with my fingers just because that shows my students that I, I can read it like they're reading it and I can even un have that more understanding of what it's like for them to figure out what these dots mean and how they work together. So being Braille competent is a very huge part of my training to also be a teacher of the visually impaired. Learning from adult role models who are blind or low vision has been a production of the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind, 33 North Institute Street, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80903, 719-578-2100, www.csdb.org. Videography by Deb Branch and Sean Levier, copyright 2014. Audio description, Jim Olson, editing assistants, Diane Kevington, Dr. Laura Douglas, captioning, Neil Anthony Thomas, Corey McCormick, transcription, Eleanor Vasquez. A man is using a slate and stylus, a braille writer, a refresher braille, and types on a laptop. Technology and people who are blind or low vision with George McDermott. Braille part one. Braille is a form of tactual literacy for those who are blind and visually impaired. Braille consists of contracted and uncontracted braille. Uncontracted braille is simply the letters and numbers of the alphabet where everything is spelled out in full as it would be in print. Contracted Braille consists of various combination of dots in the Braille cell itself that allows you to have contractions for various words. So, for example, T-H-E is, or the sign is dots 2346 in the Braille cell. And this allows for much smaller books, uh, a much shorter length than you would find in uh, if you simply used uncontracted braille. The, one of the most basic forms of braille writing comes in the form of a slate and stylus. A slate consists of a panel which you use to uh, put in uh, braille via the use of the stylus, which is a little uh, pin, like so. And I'm going to demonstrate how this is used. Braille is typically written from left to right. However, when you use a slate and stylus, you're punching the holes in the back of the paper, so you begin on the right-hand side and move over to the left. The structure of the cell is still the same, uh, so, for example, a B is dots 1 and 2. Uh, so that would be the same, it would just be a matter of dots 1 and 2 being the upper rightmost and the, cell, the dot right below that uh, for B. So. so I have an example here of me writing uh, using this slate and stylus, and currently I have on here, uh, my name is George, and I have an addiction. Four. And I've reached the end of the line, so I'm going to, go, I'm going to go down to the next line. Uh, 
iced. Coffee, period. And then, as you can see, I have legible grail. And so although this method can seem somewhat arduous, it's a very inexpensive and easy way to produce braille. The cost of a slate and stylus is quite low, anywhere from a couple bucks on up. And slates come in both plastic and metal. The next step in braille production is the braille writer, or brailler as it's called, also called. Uh, here I have two examples. The first is the Perkins Classic Brailler, which has been in use for over 50 years. And the other example is the new Perkins APH Braille Writer. The Brailler consists of a six key keyboard for Braille entry. The six keys with the space bar between them represent a Braille cell. And so you'd use the different keys to put in a different piece of the Braille cell. You then have the backspace key and the enter or new line key, as well as the carriage return, the braille eraser, and the margin. I'm now going to demonstrate how to write using a braille writer. This is a test of the new Perkins APH Braille Writer. I enjoy It's ease of use and the light footprint. Then if I were to make an error, for example, I put an F down when I meant to put some other letter down. I can simply backspace and then delete. And then put in what I meant to put in. And if I wish to read what I wrote, written, I can pop up the back and then I have a smooth flat surface for reading, which is a very nice and innovative feature. Braille part two. The next step in getting into the realm of higher tech is the use of a braille note taker. Uh, the note taker is defined by being basically a PDA with braille. And so on one of these devices, you would have the ability to do word processing, navigate the internet, and various other tasks which are performed through the use of the Braille keyboard, as well as uh, getting output both from speech and from the Braille display itself. We're going to be demonstrating now the Braille Sense Plus made by GW Micro and we currently have a set of speakers plugged in in order to enhance the audio experience. And so I've turned on the BrailleSense Plus. You will note that the row of dots that were all up while the machine was turned off are now lowered except for the ones that are up and that is uh, shows what is being displayed on the screen currently file manager along with left parenthesis, F, right parenthesis, which indicates that if we were to type in the F 
uh, command into the uh, Braille keyboard, it would then put us to this item. You can navigate uh, several ways, uh, either by the first letter of the program that you wish to access, as you would with a computer, or you can simply go down using the spacebar command. Word processor left parenthesis, W right parenthesis, GW sets navigation left parenthesis, V right parenthesis. Or you can go back up in the list by using the backspace, or also called the dot seven command. Word processor left parenthesis. W right parenthesis. And then when you've reached a program that you wish to use, you can press the enter button or the dot eight command. Blank. And it said blank, which means that we're into a Braille document. I'm now uh, an, a Word document. I'll now create a Word document. I'm now in the Word processor, so I'll simply space start typing. Dot six. T H is. I S is A A T E S test of of A A N O T E T A K E R note taker with with A A dot six dot C R E F R E S H A B L E refreshable dot B R L rail lower D P L A Y lower D display period. And then if I wish to read through the document, I can do so using a hotkey command to read it back auditorily. Or if I wish to simply read it using the refreshable braille display, I can do so using the up and down scroll buttons on either side. That indicates that I've reached the top of the document, so I can then start reading through. Go down to the next line and continue reading. And then if I notice that there's an error somewhere that I need to fix, I can use one of the cursor routing buttons above the display to go to that point in the document. So for example, if I notice there's an error, I simply click the button above where the, uh, what I'd like to switch, fix, and the cursor goes there, I can fix it, and then subsequently go right back where I need to go. It works rather like a mouse on a computer in a document. And then if I wish to exit, I can do so uh, either by saving the document or if I simply wish to uh, go out, I know that I'm going to be working on this document later in the day, I can simply hit the F1 key, which is the lower left hand most button uh, below the Braille display. File manager left parenthesis, F right parenthesis. And it takes me back out to the main menu where I can subsequently perform another task. I'm now going to demonstrate the use of this with a rather faster mode of speech. This is more the mode that I or an advanced user would use it at. So I'm back in the main menu. I'll skip to the word processor by simply using the W command. <laughs> And that popped me right back into the document. Yep. And then I'll simply start brailing again. And again, I can go through it in the same manner, read quickly, and edit and perform a number of tasks in this manner. Finally, we have a refreshable Braille display. The refreshable Braille display differs from the note taker in that it typically will have no internal memory. You simply use it either via USB or Bluetooth connection in order to have a uh, tactile interaction with the computer or device that you're using. The device we have here is the 
Refresher Braille 18 cell display produced by the American, available from the American Printing House for the Blind. The 18 cells along with the cursor routing buttons and then below that we have the way that you would input Braille via the Perkins style keyboard in the spacebar. Braille Part 3. We come now to hard copy Braille and hard copy Braille comes in several different types. I have here what's called a twin vision book where the braille and print are together. The book looks just like the print copy of the book, but inside it has braille. So we have the print on one side, and on the other side we have the braille that you can subsequently read. And then you can turn the page and go from there. I also have an example of a hard copy textbook. This is an example of a pre-calculus textbook produced by the American Printing House for the Blind. And inside, you can see on one side we have an example of hard copy braille, and on the other side we have an example of what's called a tactile graphic, which is used to produce various graphical images that you can't reproduce on a refreshable braille display. A girl in high school reads from a textbook in Braille. A boy in high school reads from a textbook in Braille. An elementary student reads a Thanksgiving story in Braille. Technology and people who are blind or low vision with George McDermott. Braille Part 3. Video production Deb Branch, Tara Lynn Gray. Consultation Jim Olson. Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind. Learning, thriving, leading. 33 North Institute Street, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80903 www.csdb.org American Sign Language is a visual language and it is not universal. Same holds true with spoken language. For example, English, Spanish, French, they're all distinct languages. Same holds true with sign language. There's British Sign Language, French Sign Language, Mexican Sign Language, and they are all distinct. When it comes to ASL and English, they are not the same language. They have their own grammar, their own rules, and their own order. They are two distinct languages. Eye contact is extremely important within the deaf culture. And the reason being is, is when people are signing with one another and that eye contact is broken, it is considered rude. Deaf people, in general, when they are signing, if that eye contact is broken, they will wait for the participant to make that eye contact again and continue signing. Which hand should you use when you're signing? For signing and fingerspelling, you have a dominant hand and a non-dominant hand. Let me give you an example. I'm a righty, I write right-handed, and I would sign in this fashion. Hello, my name is Cindy with my dominant right hand. Now if you write lefty, that would be your dominant hand and the right hand would be your non-dominant hand and the signing would look like this. Hi, my name is Cindy. Take a look at this. My name is Cindy. Again, if you write righty, sign with your right dominant hand and stick with it. If you write lefty, you sign with your dominant left hand and stick with that. Don't alternate between the two. Just pick one and stick with it and use that dominant hand. Okay, so you're learning sign language. Here's a tip. You need to look at the face because that's where the expressions are and they will change the meaning. Let me give you an example. I understand. I'm not understanding. It's critical to look at the face. Don't focus on the hands. Here's an example. My daughter, Ashlyn, she loves shopping. She loves to go to the Chapel Hills Mall. My daughter, Ashlyn, she just loves to go shopping. 
at the Chapel Hills Mall. Cookie Cookie Bake 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 Do you want to bake cookies? Yes! Sugar cookies are my favorite. Okay, I need first flour, second eggs, third milk, fourth sugar. Baking cookies is fun. Cookie. 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 Bake. Bake. 